Okay, for our last presentation of this morning's summer school session, we have Laura Havner from Yale University continuing discussion about um, experimental results from heavy ion collisions and this time with a focus on LHC. Go ahead, Laura. Yep, okay, thank you. Okay, so hi, like you said, I'm Laura Havner um, and I'll be talking about experimental results from the LHC side. Um, so just a disclaimer that I will not be able to cover everything and selected a few topics to focus on that I thought um, would be relevant for what you will uh, be thinking about at the school this week. Um, and so as Raghav already nicely described, we can produce the QGP phase of the QCD diagram in laboratories using, the heavy, using heavy ion collisions. And so he discussed many interesting results from Rick, but we also do this at the LHC. And so the LHC produces higher energy collisions than Rick, so around an order of magnitude higher center of mass. Um, and so you can see, looking at the, uh, the QCD diagram of the temperature versus the baryon density, that this allows us to access higher temperature on the QCD phase space. Uh, therefore, at the LHC, we expect to produce a hotter, denser, longer lived QGP than network. And so Raghav already nicely described uh, evolution of the heavy ion collision. So I'll just say uh, quickly here that we have this QGB medium produced um, that has a low uh, shear viscosity. So it's a nearly perfect fluid. And we study this uh, using soft probes. Um, it's also very opaque, leading to large part-turn energy loss, and we can study this using hard probes. And so, uh, like at RIC, we characterize the QGP using these soft and hard probes um, now at the LHC. Uh, with respect to the soft probes, uh, we have particles produced in the final state from the flowing medium produced um, in, the, in the heavy ion collisions, which we measure with correlations and fluctuations of soft particles. And here we can learn about global macroscopic properties of the QGP through the dynamics of the bulk. Um, hard probes are high momentum transfer processes that occur early in the collision and traverse the medium and experience its full evolution. And so some examples of these are jets, heavy flavor, corconia, electroweak bosons. Um, and today I'll focus um, specifically on jets. And so we can use these to learn about the microscopic microscopic properties of the QGP through uh, their interactions with the medium. And so finally, we use PP and P lead collisions as a reference, but although I won't discuss this today, it's important to keep in mind that understanding these is also part of the story, especially with recent hints of QGP effects in small systems. Raghav also touched on this, um, and interesting studies of QCD um, in just your standard proton-proton collisions. And so I'll, I'll start by talking about soft probes. And so as I already said, the QGP produced in heavy ion collisions is found to be, or expected to be a nearly perfect fluid. And the signature of this is the collective behavior of final state particles. And so this can manifest itself in a couple of ways. So first we can have isotropic expansion where pressure gradients build up in the expanded medium and boost particles in the radio direction, producing radial flow. And so this is sensitive to the bulk viscosity of the medium or its resistance to this expansion. Um, additionally, uh, we can have anisotropic expansion where uh, initial spatial asymmetries in, in the initial state in non-central collisions lead to particles boosted more in one direction than the other um, in the final state or anisotropic flow. And this is sensitive to the shear viscosity or the medium's resistance to this anisotropic flow. And so how do we measure radial flow? So while well, this radial flow leads to a boost of the particle's momentum in a radial direction, which means that the particles will experience a shift in their mean PT. And so we can see this um, in here in a, in a, in, uh, a particle uh, yield distribution as a function of PT in lead, uh, or as a function of PT and lead lead compared to PP. Whereas you focus just on the black curves, you see a clear shift in PP uh, between PP and lead lead that's coming from this radial flux. And so this radial flow is related to the size of the system. So the larger the size of the medium, the more radial flow you expect. And so now I'll talk about anisotropic flow, which is where you have an initial uh, spatial anisotropy in non-central collisions that leads to a momentum anisotropy in the final state. And this momentum anisotropy leads to more particles in one direction versus the other, which leads to an anisotropy in the final particle state as you use the angle distribution. Um, and so here we see this modulation pattern show up that we call it ridge. 
And so this final state anisotropy is also sensitive to fluctuations in the initial geometry, where you can see we can also, besides the, this elliptical shape, we can also get uh, triangle -yield shapes, square shapes, et cetera. And in general, this anisotropic flow is related to the shape of the system. So the more initial kind of shape we have, the more anisotropic flow we have in the final state. And so this ridge uh, shape can be characterized using a harmonic expansion, which I, which I show uh, here, um, where the um, amplitudes of the modulation at Vn can be extracted, where V2 represents the elliptical flow, V3 triangular, et cetera. And so how do we measure this anisotropic flow? And so one way is using two particle correlations, where we look at correlations between pairs of particles in the final state. And so this is shown here in a, in a delta eta, delta phi distribution between all pairs of particles, where you can see this ridge shape show up along phi. But we also see a peak in a, in a nearby region, um, in, the, in, in the nearby region of the eta distribution. This is from a jet and is considered a non-flow contribution. In any flow measurement, we want to remove non-flow contributions to focus on the soft physics, and thus in these two particle correlations, an eta gap. Um, is applied and this non-flow region is removed. We then can project on the delta phi axis and see this modulation and fit it using the harmonic expansion and extract the Fourier coefficients Vn, where you can see the different contributions in the different colors. And so now we can look at the, the, the different Vns. Um, we can look at the details of the different Vns. So I'll start by looking at the Vn as a function of the particle Pt where the different um, harmonics are shown in the different colors. And so you can see that Vn shows an increase and then a decrease with Pt. And so we can separate this into two regions. The increase in Pt is expected um, from flow um, described by viscous hydrodynamics where you just have this push out, more uh, pushing more pushing out from the, per, from the pressure of the, of the momentum of the particles. Um, and, but then at very high Pt, we expect this to be dominated by jets and wouldn't expect to see a significant Vn, but we do indeed see one. And so this um, is suspected to be, a, or is usually attributed to differential energy loss effects where um, jet goes through more or less of the medium depending on the different paths it travels. And so now we can look at the, the Vns as a function of the centrality of the collision, uh, which Raghav nicely, uh, which Raghav nicely described for you guys. Um, and so our focus first on the V2, where we see that the V2 increases and then decreases with the centrality of the collision. And so this um, comes from two competing effects related to both the shape and the size of the system. And so first we have the increase in the initial uh, asymmetry of the system, which leads to more anisotropy or shape in the final state. We also had the decrease of the system size with centrality, so less interactions can lead to less overall flow. And finally, if we look at the V3 in the blue, um, we see that it remains flat and then has a slight decrease. And so here we have the effect of the decreasing system size, but also the effect of initial geometrical fluctuations increasing for less central collisions. And so we can also uh, look at the comparison in different collision systems. So in, at the LHC, we usually look at lead-lead collisions, but we can also look at xenon-xenon collisions where, a smaller, where we have a smaller system. So there will be uh, more initial state fluctuations and more viscous effects. And so we can uh, separate this into two regions where in central collisions, we see the xenon-xenon VNs are higher, um, which is expected because of the more fluctuations in the smaller systems leading to a higher VN. Um, but then in peripheral collisions, we see that the, the lead lead becomes higher. And um, here, this is because the viscous, viscous effects are more important um, in more peripheral collisions and the viscosity will uh, lower the flow. And so we're seeing this effect larger in the, in, in the xenon collisions, in the xenon system. Okay, so uh, given that we looked at both the radio and the anisotropic flow, we can now look at, recently, we've been able to look at the interplay between these two. So looking at VN being PT correlation. So Raghav also discussed this with respect to STAR um, and uh, he nicely described that we can uh, quantify this using the Pearson coefficient. And so here we're looking at the interplay between the radial expansion or the size of the system and the anisotropic expansion or the shape of the system. 
This uh, variable is also sensitive to nuclear deformation, where xenon Z9 is actually a deformed nucleus and the lead is not. And so what we see is that in central collisions, we see this rho to be uh, positive, indicating that there is a positive correlation between the rho and V2, or the more, uh, the more uh, initial shape we have, the larger the, the, larger the system size. Um, and we also see that the xenon-xenon in, in central collisions um, has less correlation than the lead-lead, which could be coming from the nuclear deformation decreasing the correlation for xenon-xenon. Um, and these results are also compared to a uh, calculation from hydrodynamics, um, where you can see that these calculations do not fully describe this data. And so in general, this is a new novel probe where the experimental and, and theorists are still shorting, sorting out um, its interpretation, but it, has a, but it has the power to constrain models, which is a great place where Deathscape can fit in. And so uh, now we can look at extracting the QGP properties that I discussed before from these analyses, um, where recently Bayesian analyses, um, including one from Jetscape that I think you'll hear a lot about later in this week, um, use measurements of the VN, the mean PT, particle years, et cetera, that I've kind of showed already in both LHC and RIC to perform a global extraction of the shear and both viscosity of the medium as a function of temperature, which I'm showing here. And so you can see the shear viscosity on the left, the bulk viscosity on the right. And so you see, for example, that the shear viscosity was found indeed to be uh, very small as expected from this nearly perfect fluid. And so in general, um, making precise uh, differential measurements of soft probes in different occlusion systems and energies is helpful so that we can extract these global, global properties of the medium and better constrain their values. Okay, so now I'll move on to discussing hard probes. So things that transverse the medium, specifically jets. And so uh, here I'm showing uh, a jet in the standard proton-proton collision where a parton coming from high momentum QCD scattering showers and hydronizes to produce a jet. In heavy ion collisions, this jet has to traverse the QGP medium and thus strongly interacts with this medium. And so this uh, leads to both jet energy loss and modification of the jet's internal substructure or what we call jet quenching. And so this jet quenching depends on the, uh, the path that the jet travels in the medium um, and also the initial flavor of the partons. So whether it's a quark or gluon where uh, gluons interact stronger and um, experience more uh, energy loss and modification. Uh, Laura? And so jets, yes. Sorry, there's a question in the chat. Sure. Uh, is why do you compare the correlation of V22 rather than just V2? I don't know if I, you I can see the chat. Sorry, you mean in? It's in the chat. I can't see the chat, sorry. Oh, okay. <laughs> it says, why do we compare the correlation of V2 superscript to rather than just V2? You mean in which result? I don't know, I'm just repeating the question. <laughs> I mean, Vn squared rather than Vn. Oh, you mean in the row, in the in the Pearson coefficient? It's not really squared, it's just V2 with two particles. That's what yes, I, yes, I think it's a notation of confusion. Yeah, I think it's a, yeah, it's it's V2 from two particles, not, yeah, thanks Raghav, but yeah, not the, not the square of the Vn. Aritya, did that address your question? Okay. Okay, cool. Really? All right, so I think, okay, thanks for the question. Okay, uh, continuing. Uh, so jets in um, heavy ion collisions are particularly uh, challenging experimentally because they have a large background um, due to the, the underlying event of the flowing particles under these, the jet. So in our jet measurements, we have the, uh, the kind of like flow as our, as our background, whereas as we saw previously in the, in, the, um, in the measurements of flow, we actually have jets as our background. Um, and so you can see this in this uh, calorimeter, distri dis um, this, this, uh, calorimeter tower distribution in the detector, where you see this, this uh, large background fluctuating underneath the jet. And so uh, this background contributes energy inside the jet cone. And also there's jets 
kind of hiding underneath it that we need to find. And we have to be particularly careful with upward underlying event fluctuations, which can be taken as, uh, as jets called fakes, which energies are on the order of the jet itself. And so uh, a very challenging aspect of jet measurements in heavy ions is to properly remove this background and reject fakes. And how well we do this constrains how large in jet radii we can measure and how low in PT we can measure since the underlying event is larger um, for larger radii and at lower PT. And so these remaining uh, background effects after a background subtraction can be removed through what's called an unfolding procedure. And so this is useful for making quantitative comparisons to models like Jetscape. Um, and so um, an unfolding, you, so in, the, in, in data, we actually start at the detector level, but we wanna get back to the particle level since this is what the, our, our theorists um, calculate. And so we can build a response matrix. So uh, building the response between a Monte Carlo, starting with a Monte Carlo simulation and putting it through the detector simulation to get the relationship between the particle and the detector level. And then we can use this response to move in the opposite direction. So going from the detector to the particle level by doing a matrix inversion, where unfolding is just a complicated way of doing this uh, matrix unfolding. And then we can compare this unfolded data directly to our model. And so what are some consequences of jet quenching that we expect to observe experimentally? So we expect to see jets lose energy on average, such that at a fixed value of the jet momentum, the, the, um, the momentum is shifted to lower values, so the jet rate will be suppressed. So we should be missing jets at a fixed PT. Um, jets have a complicated internal structure, even in a vacuum from the parton shower and hydronization. And we expect the structure to be modified in the medium. Um, and finally, there are some jet medium interactions at play. And so first we expect moment, the momentum broadening where, um, where, uh, where a soft gluon emission widens the jet and can cause energy loss outside the jet cone. Um, and also the medium can respond to the jet by, uh, uh, by producing a wake, which then can push soft particles back inside the jet cone. And so I'll start by discussing some measurements of jet uh, suppression. And so jets, like I already said, jets are expected to be suppressed at a fixed value of jet BT because of the shift in their spectra due to energy loss. And this can be quantified using the nuclear modification factor RAA, which is looking at the number of jets and lead like collisions compared to that in PP, where the PP is scaled up um, by the nuclear geometry. And so here we have what we expect in RAA less than one um, if we're seeing jet suppression. And so here, uh, and so um, uh, we've uh, measured jet suppression over a very large range in jet uh, momentum um, and, and observed it and observed an RAA less than one over this, over this full scale where um, Rogov talked about some jet measurements at RIC where uh, jet suppression is measured up to um, 30 for lower PT jets, and it's measured up to about 30 GB. Um, the LHC measures higher PT jets over a large kinematic range, where you can see between Alice in the center and Atlas on the right, that jet suppression is seen from 60 out to a TeV in jet energy. So we would like to push these jet measurements at the LHC, both down to lower PT to connect to RIC and also to larger R but we are limited because of the uh, large background fluctuations. And so we can use a machine learning approach to try to push down to low PT in ALICE, and we can go to larger R at ATLAS and CMS by using higher PT jets where the, the background um, is, uh, where it's less affected by the background. Um, but why are we interested in pushing to larger R or low PT? And so with respect to larger R, we have the possibility to recover energy loss outside of the jet cone, um, and we also have the possibility to see how jet modification changes for larger versus smaller populations of jets. We would like to push to lower PT because it probes uh, different scales where the medium modifications are expected to be different. And we can also connect to measurements at REC, which are at lower PT. And so in ALICE, a new machine learning based method that learns on the constituents of the jet to correct the jet PT is found to re reduce the residual background fluctuation so we can unfold to lower jet PT. And so here I'm showing the RAA for the ML method in blue compared to the previous method from Alice in green. 
um, where you can see that the PT reach has been extended uh, from 60 down to 40 GB. And so this new result can be compared to different jet, jet quenching models and, and can be used to constrain these models that lower jet PT. And so CMS was able to look at jet suppression at very, at, at very large R by going to very high PT where there's less background effects. And so they looked at the ratio of the RAA at different R values to the RAA at R equals 0.2. And they scan R the way from R equals 0.2 to R equals one. And so we can see uh, uh, different effects at play here. So first this recovery of energy at large car could cause an increase in this ratio. Um, uh, wider jets uh, could be more suppressed and that could cause a decrease in this ratio. And also we could have the effect of different jet populations. So a larger R jets could contain two smaller R jets. And so here are the results. And so what they saw is that there is no significant radial dependence to jet suppression. So jet suppression is still seen at this large radius R equals one. And so this is interesting because we expected to maybe see this recovery of energy loss outside the cone, but we could be seeing this convoluted with the effects of the different jet populations. And this ratio is then compared here to uh, examples of different jet quenching models where we see that the models show uh, very different dependencies with R. And so this observable has an excellent discriminating power for the models and the underlying physics mechanisms at play. And so now that we've seen how jets lose energy as a composite object, we can look more, more detailed inside the jet to see how the jet substructure is modified by the media. And so we can use uh, different variables to, uh, to probe uh, different aspects of jet structure modification. So in a jet, we first have the parton shower, which then hadronizes into final state particles. So first we can look at distribution of final state charge hadrons inside the jet, which can get at, a, that get at effects of momentum broadening and also the median response. We can also look at this, look at subjets from the hard parton splittings, which helps to separate out the soft signal from softening of constituents at medium response. So we can just focus at the modification of the hard structure of the jet and the medium. And so I'll start with talking about distributions of charged particles. And so we can look at distributions of charged particles in two ways. First, the jet fragmentation gets at the longitudinal, longitudinal profile of the jet, and the jet shape looks at the radial profile of the jet, where the jet fragmentation is characterized by the variable Z, which just looks at the fraction of the charged particles jet PT of the total charged particles PT of the total jet PT. Um, and for the shapes, we can look at it versus R, which is just how far away the particle is from the jet axis. And so the jet fragmentation function is shown on the left where the ratio is taken between lead lead and PP. And so what we see is an enhancement at low Z, suppression at mid Z and enhancement at high Z, where the enhancement at low Z indicates that energy is being transferred into soft particles around the jet. The enhancement at high Z could be from difference between quark versus gluon jets where the high Z has more quark jets which survive because they are less surprised than gluons, less suppressed than gluons. Uh, the jet shapes are shown on the right where again, the ratio of lead lead to PP is shown. And so if we focus on the blue curve here, which is for a uh, softer particle, we see an enhancement to large angles which indicates that these soft particles are located at large angles from the jet axis. So we have energy going into soft particles at large angles, which is um, expected from momentum broadening effects. But these uh, measurements are complicated by, the, by uh, convolution of different jet populations, where first um, we have the quark versus gluon jets, which we discussed. And also these measurements are um, in a quenched jet PT range, but we're comparing it to an unquenched PP jet PT range. And so one solution is to look at this for photon jets. And so photon jets are useful because first they're dominated by quark jets. And second, they provide a proxy for the initial momentum of the jet since, uh, the, since the photon is expected to experience no energy loss in the medium. And so here is the photon jet fragmentation function on the right and the photon jet shape, sorry, photon jet fragmentation function on the left and the jet shape on the right, um, where, the, um, where, we, where we see a similar qualitative behavior uh, to the inclusive chase, 
except the enhancement thought to be for the court Gluon fractions seems to uh, disappear. And so now I'll move on to measurements of subjects. And so here we uh, use a soft drop grooming method to select um, from PP to select on harder splittings inside the jet to remove the soft contributions. And so these are nice because they're directly calculable in PQCB. And so um, in these uh, measurements, we can access the groomed uh, jet radius, which is looking at the opening angle between the subjects. So looking at the width of the jet. And so we apply these tools in heavy ion collisions to ask the question of first, if the medium resolved the splitting, and if so, how was it modified? So looking at coherence versus decoherence effects, where the medium either resolves or doesn't resolve the, the splittings, where we expect more energy loss for resolved splittings than for the unresolved case. And so um, now we can look at the results for this. So we're looking at the RG, which is looking at how, uh, looking at how wide versus collimated the jet is and ask if we can um, get from this the, the resolution scale of the QGP. And so this is showing the results. So I'm showing the lead, lead the, the RG distribution in lead lead compared to PP collisions with a ratio between the two is shown in the bottom panel. And so what we see is a uh, significant modification between lead lead and PP with a suppression of large angle splittings or a narrowing effect. And so, uh, in, and so this is compared to uh, different jet quenching models, including comparisons to jetscape. Um, and the data in general seems to, to seems to favor uh, incoherent loss, inco or decoherent energy loss, uh, where the medium is uh, re resolve, resolving the uh, splittings to some degree. But another model demonstrates the snaring just by using a high core collection for coherent energy loss. Um, where here uh, we have where where you could have the gluon jets uh, being more suppressed at. Uh, large angles and leaving only cork jets. And so uh, in conclusion, the LHC has uh, an array of, uh, of results in heavy ion collisions where the flow results help us to understand the macroscopic properties of the medium, of the bulk medium. Uh, many, result, uh, many results were not covered in this presentation. I include a link to, uh, I include some links to some recent talks and maybe point to some directions of where uh, some more details are shown here. Um, including, of course, I didn't mention flow and small systems. Um, the jet quenching studies provide an understanding of the microscopic structure of the QGP. Um, and of course, I didn't cover all the results here as well. Here's the link. Um, and many other results are not covered of heavy flavor coconia, electro and electro weak bosons, but there's also some very new, cool, interesting stuff going on there as well. And so just looking to the future, so um, LHC, uh, Run three is coming up in February with iron runs expected at the end of 2022. And so our detectors will have some, uh, some nice upgrades that will allow us to take higher statistic data sets in run three. Um, we also have the possibility for oxygen, oxygen collisions in run three, which uh, will be a smaller system size, which will be interesting for our probe measurements. And also um, it will be a different size medium so we can probe path length dependence of jet quenching. Um, and uh, we're entering a precision era which that needs rigorous comparisons to models and global analyses to extract properties of the QGP. And uh, Jets Group is really paving the way here. Uh, so that's all. Thanks. Thanks, Laura. We are now open for questions. There is a question in the Slack. Uh, which says, why is it possible for Rick to measure these low PT jets where the LHC has such difficulty? Yeah, so the, the, the Rick is just at a, a lower center of mass energy. So you're producing lower PT jets in general and the background is going to be kind of less, less as well compared to the PT of the jet. So you're just at a different scale because of the different center of mass energies. That question. And I, I presume just following up that um, because of the lower center of mass energies, you also have lower magnetic fields, right? And therefore that sets the limit on what you can 
Ah, uh, like you mean like in a, the, uh, uh, with respect to the, 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 like actually the detector effects for measuring yeah. the jets, or I'm talking about the background effects. Yeah, yeah, right. sure. Yeah, experimental, also detector effects as well. Sure. Wait, that actually goes the other way. No, sorry, Mike, Mike we have a half a Tesla magnet yeah. and, and the higher the Tesla, well, the higher the magnetic field, the more the more curvature, right? Sure. So you can go to uh, you will you will, you re, you will collect more lower PT particles, which might give you more background versus if you're looking for jets, which are mostly higher PT. And... Okay. There's a follow-up question which says, "Does efficiency also play a role in the detection of low PT?" Uh, in LHC, uh, if, uh, you mean efficiency for jets, right? Right, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's going to be, yeah. So it's a lower PT jet is it, you're, you're the detectors are less efficient for reconstructing lower PT jets than higher PT jets. So yes, efficiency plays a role. Um, in Alice, for example, you also have tracking inefficiency effects at high PT. Um, because Alice, or at least in some of the measurements I showed here, Alice measures charged particle jets. So you also have challenges for measuring high PT tracks. So you also can have kind of an efficiency effect at high PT as well. So, um, and, and Alice at least should get it on both sides. All right, last call for questions. If not, let's thank Laura again and bring this session to a close. I believe that's it for today and uh, summer school will reconvene tomorrow. Looking uh, forward to seeing everyone then. Uh, before we go, can I make a one quick announcement from the uh, organization?